Alrighty guys, my name is Josh McWilliams. I'm the current Vice President of the Goldfish Council. Um, we've been working with them since basically right after they founded, uh, volunteering and uh, going around to these events and helping plan these things. It's a, it's a pleasure, it's a lot of hard work, but I enjoy doing this for you guys. And um, I wanted to bring something a little different this time. Usually we stick a lot to like the, the actual fish and talk about the fish. But a lot of us um, have to come up with creative ways to keep the fish. Um, a little bit about my past uh, in, in the hobby and before then is I was I was raised in an agricultural community and um, actually raised a bunch of different livestock, um, specialized in rabbits and dairy goats. Um, so I did a lot of my own builds. And that was one thing when I was going into the goldfish community, I had a moved from basically a rural community to a downtown area and lived in a high-rise building on the 12th floor and had to somehow figure out how to fit 1,200 gallons of water in a studio that was 450 square feet in a high-rise. Oh, did, so, did you tell the landlord? Uh, <laughs> I did not let them know. There was nothing in the rules that said because we did have concrete floors. So there was nothing in the rules, that in, in the least, that said anything about fish. It was more about how many dogs you could have. So I had one dog and <laughs> hundreds of fish. <laughs> so, but are you on the so ground floor? I, I, no, 12th floor. 12th floor. 12th floor, 12th floor. a beautiful high-rise view of the bay, <laughs> Tampa Bay. It was gorgeous. Um, but basically, it kind of limited my hobby on what I could have. So I had to think of ingenious ways to try to fit more tanks in less space, Creative, I threw away at my couch and like put indoor ponds in in there. And if I had company, it was a studio anyway, so I'm like, you can just sit on the bed. But uh, <laughs> but basically, I had a lot of different ideas of ways to save space, and it just got me into building, because you can't buy these kind of things. You can't buy space-saving ideas, really. Um, everything's kind of big and monstrous. If you want big volumes of water, it just takes up a lot of space. So I started doing a lot of DIY projects to kind of, um, I like having fun with it, I like building things, and then on top of it, um, you know, I was able to save space. And since then I've moved now back to, and I moved to uh, Northern Kentucky, which is actually part of Central, uh, Central Cincinnati area. And so I, now I'm taking that into my new fish room and building even bigger builds outside in my new backyard. Now that I have an actual yard and everything, I'm taking my DIY experience in the uh, studio now to doing it in my backyard, which is amazing. So, why do we do DIY projects? Um, like again, you can do something custom. There's not, you know, they don't make everything that will work for your situation. So you can do custom builds that will suit your needs. Um, save money. Um, if you have the time, you're willing to do the builds, it usually will save you 50% or sometimes even more on the actual builds. Uh, the other thing is learning experiences. I have done DIY prototypes that have terribly failed. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a learning experience. You get to learn how to improve your design um, and having fun. Uh, right here's a picture of me and my nephew. Uh, he would come over and we actually would do DIY products together. You know, I, I'm one person and so having that extra set of hands even on a, from an 11 year old was great holding things down and keeping things in place while I'm running the drill and uh, cutting boards and stuff like that. So you can have fun with your family doing this. And a lot of times if your family members aren't into the goldfish, you'll find some of them are into construction or like doing some stuff that, that will help you out with the DIY builds. So here's some uh, tools that I keep on hand. I have a, uh, you'll find you'll, there's tools you'll need for each project, and I've been accumulating tools. But these are the ones that I probably use the most. A Sawzall, um, which is like right here. You can, it, like it says, you can saw through almost anything. Um, they're great for deconstructing pallets or cutting stuff that you already have existing that you can't get a circular saw in there too. Um, a circular saw for cutting, uh, plywood for cutting boards, a uh, power drill, assorted drill bits, and a hole saw, um, which is basically just a fitting. You'll find them a lot of times they use them to install the mechanics for your doorknobs, um, those hole saws. Um, 
PVC pipe cutters, hammer, assorted screws and nails and other fasteners. I have, I buy stuff for projects and I basically just keep them all in Ziploc baggies of each different size and just I now have a nice collection. If I need something, I just go in there, grab a Ziploc and I can work on something. Um, screwdrivers and adjustable wrench or channel locks. Those are some of the tools that I keep on hand for pretty much all my builds. And the first thing I took on when I was working in my studio apartment was I had basically about 15 whisper air pumps going at once to keep air to keep aeration in all my systems. And I'm like, you know, they're whisper quiet when you have one. <laughs> I can tell you they that this that whisper definitely adds up and it's almost like somebody yelling at you. So and especially since I was sleeping in the same room, I definitely needed <laughs> to find some way to get oxygen to all of my tanks, and it was doing a central air supply. Um, so the central air supply uh, makes providing surface agitation and filtration of breeze. Um, it saves money on your electric bill because you have one pump opposed to a bunch of smaller pumps running, and then you have more control over individual tanks' needs for aeration. So with the central line, you can basically if you have an extra tank, you need extra aeration, you just drill in an extra tap, you have a third line you can drop right into uh, a tank. So here's some of the materials that you're gonna need. Um, you need a air pump, you can either do the diaphragm or the linear piston air pumps. Linear pistons last forever, they're usually a little bit louder. Diaphragms are quieter, but you usually have to, every two or three years, either rebuild the diaphragm by a rebuild kit, um, or you have to buy a new one. You can usually find the diaphragm ones fairly inexpensive. Um, I got uh, the size I use for I think under $100. Uh, searching on eBay and found a really great deal and got one for under $100. Um, and if it goes out, I'm probably just gonna buy a brand new one. I'm not even gonna worry about it. I've already had it for four years and it has not gone out. So the other thing is your airline valves. And it's important, I. They, they sell plastic and they sell the nickel plated ones. I prefer the nickel plated ones. They're more indestructible. Um, I've had the plastic ones where like you hit it and it pops right off and breaks off into the holes that you drill in the PVC. So I generally use the uh, nickel plated ones. They're also self tapping. So when you get the drill bit and you put the drill bit in, you can literally just screw it right in and it self taps. Uh, Muffler, that's a big thing. A lot of people don't use mufflers on these uh, air supplies. It, it's basically, it's this big foam core that comes off and they come anywhere from like about two inches to about four inches. And it's this foam core that you put at the end of your pipeline that will basically bleed off any air, stops any backup and makes your actual air pump louder. And it also, um, you have better control over the sound that it makes. PVC piping, and it depends on what, how big of a fish room you're doing. If you're doing a smaller room, you know, your three quarter inch PVC works. If you're going for a bigger uh, fish room, and you might even have multiple pumps running to it, you might want to go up to your one inch uh, PVC. Um, a ball valve, ball valve, that goes right before your muffler on the end of your line. And that controls how much bleed or how much pressure you want to back up and feed air to all of your tanks. And then PVC fittings, the contractor bags at Home Depot or Lowe's are the best way. They sell them in 10 packs, they're really cheap. You're gonna need elbows, you're gonna need tees, you're gonna need uh, just regular uh, couplings. And grab some bags of those, they're super cheap that way. And I just keep them on hand because there's nothing more frustrating than doing the fill. And you think you buy exactly what you need and then you're building it and you run into a problem, you're like, oh, now I've got to drive all the way back to the home improvement store. They're very inexpensive. I like just having extras of those on hand. Um, air stones or sponge filters. Um, some people have other types of filtration. I, particularly in my hobby, I do all sponge filters. So there's basically, everything is driven by my air pump. So all of, I have giant air sponges that are this big around they go into my larger volumes of water and I have smaller ones according to the size tank they go into. And I usually always put a sponge filter 
uh, one or two in a aquarium or raised pond, and then I also add one air stem to it. Just adding that extra uh, agitation to the top of the water provides ultimate optimization of the water, and basically your fish will thrive more. With the more oxygen you drive in there, you're not driving it actually into the water, you're just making an agitation so more oxygen exchange can happen. Um, and an airline, uh, Gage bought for our system here, as you see this is very much a small version of a central air system for your fish room is what we built for the uh, show over here. And uh, he bought this great airline from Amazon, I think it was Amazon Basics Airline, <coughs> to be great 500 uh, feet. feet roll, and you can just keep it on hand and drop as many lines as you want. Um, if you buy these small bundles, I did that when I first started, and you do not realize how fast 25 feet of line goes. You're like, oh, I just did one tank. <laughs> and you're like, oh man, I gotta, now I gotta wait for it to ship again. Buying it in bulk, you save money, and um, you're gonna need a lot. If you're, if you're doing more than just a few tanks, you're gonna need that, uh, that roll. So this is kind of the way it's set up. I set the air pump on a shelf, uh, up on the wall, and then I have a piece of soft tubing that brings it with adapters to the PVC line that's mounted to the wall. So the key here is also every pump is different. Bring, buy your pump before you go and try to buy all these fittings that, that you can connect the PVC to the pump. Take your pump with you, have a small piece of PVC uh, the size that you're using, bring those two items with the home improvement store and play with all the fittings there to find what will actually work because every single one of them is different. I can tell you to go buy this, go buy that, and it's not going to work for the pump you buy. So again, after five trips back and forth, I realized, okay, let's think smarter, not harder, and brought everything there and actually put it together, a dry fit right there in the buggy inside of the uh, Home Depot. So then you have your basically your PVC. I use the, the little clamps they sell to attach PVC. Usually it's under houses. And I attach that right to the drywall around and it basically run it around the entire circumference of my fish room. If you're doing a smaller area, you can just run it down one little section of wall, whatever you, you did. It's basically customizable to your space. And then I take my drill, after I get everything mounted, I take my drill and drill right into the PVC after it's up on the wall, and I do it over where I want the tanks. If you happen to already have water and fish in there, you're going to want to put a piece of cardboard over it because you'll get little flyaways of PVC. But you drill right in, and you can take those tap tap tapping air valves and screw right in, and you drop your lines to your tank. Over here shows you the way the ball valve and the muffler are, and that's at the very end of my fish room. And that's actually closest to my bedroom, and I cannot hear any hissing, I can't hear any loud humming because of that muffler that's on the end of the system. So some key pointers uh, when you're installing this, make sure you buy a big enough pump. Um, Jimco is a really great company that sells pumps, and they sell basically anything you need to do this. You don't have to buy it all from there, but I do recommend looking at their site. They will basically tell you how big of a pump you will need for how many tanks they give suggested. Like this pump uh, with this amount of force will do 25 to 35 tanks. Go on there, decide how, and always make sure you give yourself room to grow because let's be honest, we don't stop with one or two tanks. We wind up getting a bunch more, if you're, especially if you're building a fish room, okay? Uh, make sure you test fit all your transition piece to the pump of the PVC. Like I said, when you go to the home improvement store, Bring your equipment with you. They don't say anything about you bringing anything to the store. You say, I just need to test fit all this stuff. Um, it makes multiple trips back to the home improvement store a lot easier. Make sure you start a new drill bit. After every, so, you know, I'll do 30 drills, it wears out. You'll notice towards the end of the, you know, after you're doing 25 and 30 holes, it starts wallowing out the holes to where the, it's the actually, self-tapping is, the self -tapping is not working. It's just fitting really loosely in there. Um, so have a couple of drill bits. Uh, make sure you measure twice, cut once. That's always important. My dad taught me that growing up is to definitely measure stuff
couple times before you make the cut. It'll keep you from losing actual uh, wasted lumber. Uh, and make sure you buy a big muffler along with so the bigger the pump you have, the bigger muffler you'll need at the end. Um, don't be afraid to buy a bigger one. There's not that big of a cost difference. And generally it'll save you from having the aggravation of the sound of a hissing noise that you'll get when you're running these type of things. Um, and make sure you buy extra fittings and threaded valves. Like I said before, buy, buy stuff in bulk. You'll save money and it's always good to have a few extra pieces around. Alrighty, next, um, if you're interested in breeding, this is something when I got started uh, in this part of the fancy is actually breeding. And I tried to find uh, a way to ha hatch smaller batches of Brian shrimp because I'm not a big operation. My friend Gary Hader, he has these gigantic cones that are this tall that sit in his fish room and he's feeding, uh, you know, 15 to 20 spawns of baby fish at once. So he has to hatch lots of eggs at once. I myself do just a couple of spawns at a time, so I need smaller amounts of baby brine shrimp. So I had to come up with a way uh, to hatch multiple batches, and I'm gonna show you kind of how I did that. So first, you're gonna need some wood. You're gonna need CO2 caps and an air valve. And I brought these. These you can find on eBay. They sell them for doing DIY CO2. But it's a really simple cap, but you can't recreate this any other way. You just gotta buy it from eBay. And then your air valves like this, it's got a barb on both sides. It's kind of like the same nickel ones that are threaded that I use in the air supply, but it's basically got barbs on both sides instead of the threads on the other. Do you pass that around? Yeah, I'm gonna pass that around once I get into the demonstration, I'm going to actually pass around so everybody can kind of take a look at it. And then you're going to need airline tubing. You're going to need a one liter Coke bottle. They work better than Pepsi. I have nothing against Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> this actually fits better into uh, what I created to hold the, the, the bottles, right? Okay, so you're going to need one liter Coke bottles. And as you can see on here, I cut the very bottom off. It flips over and creates a lid stops evaporation and also from stuff bubbling over okay um, and then you need a gang valve which is basically the same metal valve but it's five of them on a on one tap okay so we go here um, this is actually it in full function it's a little hard to see out here but um, this is my gang valve I basically have all my incoming airline going to that gang valve then each line from the gain valve, right here, this is connected to the gain valve, and this is sitting up in the holder that I created to hold these. And so you have five different bottles you can go at once with this method. And it creates, you can make multiple batches, you can keep the baby brine shrimp fresh. Um, and then over here, you can see the holder I made. I basically take, took a piece of wood, uh, a long board, did the hole saw, drilled holes in it, and it's the same size you use for when you're actually installing a door um, mechanics. You drill a hole, drill five holes along your board, take the extra pieces of board that I cut off and basically created these legs for it to stand up. So it's standing up here on a little table. I only have three running in this picture. Um, and then I take basically a, uh, a plastic Tupperware dish set underneath of it, and you're basically to hatch brine shrimp, if for those that are unfamiliar with that, you need a heat source and light, which I have a clamp on light basically above it. Once you turn off the air supply on that gang valve down here, you turn off the air supply to whichever one you want to harvest from. You turn that off, all of the baby brine shrimp will then, you turn off your light on the top, they will come down and settle at the bottom, and all you have to do is turn this valve. And I collect it in a net, uh, as you can see right here. And I collect all the baby brine shrimp in a fine brine shrimp net. All the wastewater goes into my Tupperware. I usually throw that on plants, um, as long as they're, they can handle salt. <laughs> I killed a couple different varieties that didn't do too well. <laughs> but um, that's basically how it works. So one of the, some of the key uh, pointers is make sure to drill straight into the board. Make sure you're drilling straight down. 
It'll keep it from wobbling too much. If you have too much of an angle, it's gonna set the Coke bottle on an angle. So you're gonna drill that hole directly into the board as straight as possible. Make sure to check the fit of the soda bottle with the hole saw opening in, before you do it on your main board. So if you're first time doing it and you wanna make sure you got the right size of everything, just take a scrap piece of wood and just drill into any piece of wood and check your Coke bottle and make sure it'll go in there. And you want something that will sit about right here so that way it doesn't tip over as easy. Once you put some water weight in here, it actually holds up really straight, okay? Uh, make sure to have your Tupperware to fit under the structure that you build to harvest in because another thing is brine shrimp wastewater really smells bad after it's been sitting for you know a couple days. I've experienced that and that's not a smell you wanna keep lingering around or spilling off of. So I try to always have that Tupperware thing to collect, I can go spray it with a little bleach or alcohol, sterilize it and every couple days and it will keep it any foul smells from the area. So uh, the other thing is to make sure you have a light over the hatchery when set up. Again, this clamp on lights are a lifesaver. I use them all over my fish room, but clamping one over them, and do not use an LED light. You actually need a light that provides a little bit of heat. So you try to use a old fashioned light bulb that actually produces a little bit of heat with the light and make sure you find a fine net for har harvesting baby brine shrimp. They actually sell on eBay or Amazon. You can generally find nets that are geared towards actually brine shrimp nets is what they're called. And they can catch basically the baby brine shrimp without getting all that nasty water and putting it into your tank. All right, so next we're gonna go to a raised pond. So here's where it got interesting in my uh, studio apartment. I'm trying to find, I put a couple of under a gallon water trough for livestock first. And so I'm like thinking of other, and I ran out of room to put that large of a volume. So I said, well, what else could I do? Um, and in thinking, keeping my budget in mind also, what, how can I create some other space for a fish um, using a pond? But that also looked good because I also had to have guests coming into my studio and I wanted it to look good. I just didn't want these old Tupperware bins laying around with zip ties and bungee cords keeping them together. And it basically, I created these raised ponds. Um, and again, like Jeff was saying, he built some basically like this, and the same principles apply. Um, it's just on a larger scale. So I'll show you how I did a 55 gallon uh, tote from Home Depot and turned it into it. So the first one I made, I actually made out of recycled pallets. And you know, repurposing pallets was really big about five years ago, and people are still doing it now. I have to tell you, it's a lot more work <laughs> to tear apart a pallet and get sal salvageable wood out of the pallet than just going and buying a few boards. But if you're into deconstruction, or you have a family member that loves to tear things apart, maybe a teenager that needs some frustration let out, let them do this part. But uh, basically, I, I use recycled pallets today. We use some. Um, some actual wood that we bought, but um, you could do the same thing. A 55 gallon HDX tote from Home Depot. Lowe's does not sell one that actually will fit into this design. Um, the HDX tote is the only one I have found that will actually fit like this. Other ones have extra notches and stuff that you really can't use or have to build something kind of crazy to get it to fit into. And you're gonna need really just one two by four for your legs. So one thing you want to do is make sure you cut your slat lengths and uh, lengths of 23 and 46. Um, again, measure your tub. They might, you know, different models come out. They might change the design. Um, this was my original build and I hope it works on this brand new tub and they didn't change the design because we had everything shipped here. Uh, make sure you cut your two by fours and lengths of 18. And basically you're measuring the HDX tub. You want to measure underneath this lip all the way down to the floor. And that's the length you want your height to be for your two by four. And then make sure your cuts are as straight as possible and make sure when you're using the recycled wood for pallets that all the nails are removed. And sometimes I'll use that Sawzall to use the whole board and I'll leave the nails in because I kind of like the look of the old nails in it. I will actually take the Sawzall cut through the nail, the saws will actually cut through the nail, you can use the whole board, and then I take a grinder and just grind the back of the nail so they're, so they're flush with the board and soft. 
Alrighty, so now you guys get to see me build one of these live. Situated here. If you want to save the lid, find some other cool idea to do with the lid, you can do that, but it's not really needed for the build. to build, but once I learned how to do this, it was pretty easy. So I start with my top slats, and this is basically the long side. I just usually get my screw started and lined up before I actually go into the wood. Makes it a little easier. it is flush as possible. Lined up. Oh, oops. But that doesn't happen. Is there a type of wood that you would recommend for this? Um, well, it depends on if you're using it outside or inside. Mm -hmm. Inside, I typically will use any kind of wood. Right. Outside, I try to buy pressure treated wood. Okay. And that's and what this also, is? Yes. And also, if if you happen to not get um, fine pressure treated wood that you want to use, yeah. you can always uh, buy a stain or any type of sealant and put on it if you're going to use it outdoors. Do you purposely buy screws that are the same color? Uh, Gage bought these because I think he's taking this home and he wants it to look real pretty. Uh, <laughs> so I've made them all kinds of different ways. And yeah. Like I said, I've used the um, actual uh, recycled pallet wood with all yeah. the different kind of colored and aged woods. Mm -hmm. That actually looks really cool. Yeah, I'd imagine it would. So, and I went through, uh, my studio was like, um, an industrial like studio it had oh, concrete yeah. countertops, concrete floors. So using all the reclaimed wood, like I made it's a wine really glass accent, holder right? out of a pallet and had like big bolts coming out that actually held the wine glasses. Nice. And did stuff like that. So it really worked. So just depending on your decor is how you want to go with this. You can make this, you know, look super fancy or you can uh, make it look rustic. Thank you. But we could paint it any color we wanted, yeah. or, because you, it's not going to affect the fish at all. Yeah, right? if you want, if you want a pink tub for your, I was fish, thinking like a dark gray. You can go pink. Yeah. And the dimensions of this wood, there you could walk in and say, "I want slats." Yeah, these are fence, basically fence slats, slats. Uh, okay. that they um, repair like privacy fences with. Oh, okay. So if you want to, again, do something with, um, without actually using the reclaimed uh, 
Yeah, I have an uncle that's a carpenter. You can use these. Yeah. These are really inexpensive. Yeah. They usually are like two dollars a slat. Oh, okay. And you really only need uh, six slats. Six slats. Yeah. Okay. If you do want to go out and buy the materials to do this. And the tub is only $20, so you literally can get this under like $30 or $35, even if you buy all the materials you need. Wow. And, and even, at, even at the dollar per gallon sale, can't beat that. you can't get, you know, a 55-gallon uh, a fish tank. And there's no problem with the chemical leaching in these no. tubs? They're no. safe Those are safe. I've had means. them run for like five years now, and I've had nothing but great things come out of that. Most of the fish I've bred were raised in those tubs. Because they're also a little bit shallower, and as uh, kind of Jeff was touching on earlier, you know, the, the younger the fish, for most varieties, you really don't want super deep water. Right. So these provide, you know, where they're not as deep as my stock tanks. My stock tanks are actually two two foot deep. These are like 18 inches. So as long as you're, you're not doing a uh, a top view fish, you're fine. Or excuse me, Japanese fish. I was just yeah, I was just thinking about an, some outdoor. This would be a great yeah. way to have it look like. Because a raccoon is not going to break through this. Or... Okay, so you have one like this. Nice. Create another one. like QVC style and like started making a little bit of this and <laughs> then pull out the finished product but but you can see we really like this the, how yeah well this will show you exactly how like how much time it. and then we'll double this because it's gonna be our first time making it. <laughs> <laughs> now have you built this for other sizes or just specifically for this I have size? built this for other sizes uh -huh. and later in the presentation you're gonna see some other stuff I did with pallets to go around uh, stock ponds. Oh, nice. So these go around the tubs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To support them, because they, they're not meant to hold 55 gallons of water. They bow oh, they when bow. you start filling them with water. And after they bow, they yeah, <laughs> it's not fun. This just gives them extra. Yeah, this design strength. came after uh, the first one I got. I was like, oh, this is a great size for a goldfish, and it started bowing. And then I tried like putting a wood slat in between to hold them. The wood actually snapped. I used zip ties. Tried all these different ways to get that from not bowing and building basically a structure around it is the only way to guarantee that it's not going to bow. And over time, you might have some slight bowing with these fence boards, but it's not real bad. It's not structurally. It's definitely not going to crack. It might just bow a little bit and be a little bit more roundier than a perfect rectangle. A little bit more oval. <laughs> yeah. That's OK. Any other questions you have, you can just about while I'm doing this. How you been? Huh? How you been? How have I been? <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, I, the move was wonderful. I mean, it was a little stressful to move across the country with hundreds of goldfish. I'd imagine. But uh, I have to say, I'm enjoying the new four seasons that I never got in Florida. Um, Including I say, the snow. The snow was fun. I actually kind of it was almost like magical. Like I'd never seen physical snow. Oh, oh God. And so oh, okay. it, the first ice storm we had, you were like it a looked child. like it was, like it was so amazing. And the, it was actually at nighttime, I go out and every tree is just covered in ice. And it was kind of with the street lights on it. It was real magical. Yeah, yeah. And then first snow came, I made some snowballs and actually uh, hit 
my dog with a snowball was funny. Like, I'd roll the dog and actually, like, nail him with Launch it. Him. But he thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, I can't see the inside of the toe, but is the bottom flat? It's got little ridges. And I typically, because I keep sand in all of my tubs and tanks, the ridges don't bother me. But I did have, before I started using sand, I was keeping them bare. The great thing is all the poop collects in those ridges. And, then and you, you can take the vacuum just along the ridges and it sucks it all right up. Is there, is there an area at the bottom that's flat enough that you could put like a bulkhead for a bottom right? Yes, you could. Yeah, once uh, we get this all together, I'll have everybody come up and take a look at it. Actually, one thing. You even keep sand with your tiny babies? Yeah. Okay. I have started to use sand with all my fish. I think it promotes their health. Beneficial bacteria grow in it. Uh -huh. um, you can also pass this around so you can kind of see how that works. And it's a little dirty. I didn't clean it after I had my last batch of brine shrimp in it. Yeah, it's fine. And always when you're doing this, do your top and bottom beam first then your middle beam, so it'll make sure it stays pretty square. I know what I'm getting at Black Friday this year, I get your room. I might not be able to wait, but... I'm a Makita fan. 100 bucks for the, the whole kit? Yeah. Nah. Uh, not a bad deal. Nope. That one went through. Too much angle on that one. This board is just a small splitty board. It's probably dry. Learn to use a drill. How old was I? Yeah. About yeah. maybe six. My dad was a uh, heating and air guy and did a lot of building. And that was every holiday. Was what did he get? He got like new drills, new saws, and then I ruined them all. <laughs> cutting something that should have been cutting. Something along those lines. Okay. So now you got your your two sides here. Usually now the table's going to be a little obsolete. Throw that, that's that. Now basically what I do is stand these two up. Like this. Oh, so is this a slat cut in half? This is the, basically, so a slat is six foot long. Uh -huh. And so you use the long part there, you make one cut. Then you have basically this with, with that, you know, the normal dog ear, like, uh -huh. on it. And then after that, you just cut the excess dog ear to fit, make these 20, forget the exact count. 28, 28? 23. 23, yeah.
Josh, just be careful that that one went all the way down. Those two went all the way down so you don't cut your hand. Thank you. They probably made a little too long screws. So. That's all right. terrible to get your hand cut. small animals, but I think I'm going to build one of these just for my guinea pigs to hang out outside. Yeah. Eat some grass. I'll keep them well contained on a nice space. How many babies? Just two. And two females. But I finally have like some yard space. Oh. And I, I just I want to keep them outside during the day. Put an ice pack in one side and let them hang out. How many of these do you think you've built, Joshua? Um, I've built about 10 of them. Because, honestly, I moved twice. Yeah. And I basically said to myself, like, it'll take up so much space in a U-Haul that I'll just remake them. I save the tubs. And yeah. Just remake the, because I can stack all the tubs. Yeah, they're so stacked. And then I basically make new ones whenever I get to the new house. So and then if you were keeping these outside, like, what's your favorite kind of, like, netting? So, to, I'll to show protect? you something I built okay, for sorry. them. It's all right. So, basically, this is what you have. And hopefully the nails don't... But it basically will contain this, so it's going to bow a little bit like this once you fill it with water. And then it will perfectly contain this unit. Nice. And it looks... Yeah. So much better. It's presentable. So another thing I did when I was using it in my uh, in my apartment, I wanted even the top to look good, so I took extra fence boards and made a board around it and drilled them into the studs also. Yeah. And it gave it a more finished look. 
there's still like a gap you could run air hoses. Air hoses, through, yeah. yeah. I put all kinds of stuff through through the yeah. gaps in it. Okay. So there's our raised pond build. So I want to share with you some of my other DIY builds. So aquarium stands. Um, that's another good way to save money. And also if you have a custom sized tank or something, using just two by fours and plywood, you can basically make your own aquarium stand. 3D backgrounds, those are getting really big and popular. I don't know if you've priced them out. They're extremely expensive. You can actually use the construction foam spray and create your own DIY background by making all these hills and lumps with it and you throw sand right on it while it's still wet and you just leave it like almost over cover the foam. Uh -huh. It'll sink down into it and then when it dries and sets, you have a 3D fish safe aquarium background. Wow. So you can add, like this one has actual roots and rocks that they stuck in while it was still wet that were coming out of it. But you can do that all by basically placing whatever you want to in that background as long as you can make sure it's fish safe wood and stuff that you're using. Um, that construction foam is completely fish safe and the um, and then of course sand is. So putting that sand, you can use whatever color sand you want on it to create a different color. Do you do it directly on the glass or do you do it like a piece of styrofoam? I've used a piece of styrofoam and I've done directly on glass. Once it's on the glass, it's there forever. If you want to be able to change it out, you can do it on a piece of styrofoam cut out the exact shape of the glass, and then basically just run some silicone across the back of the styrofoam and glue it on while it's dry, and let that cure, and you can, that way it can, can be pried off of there if you ever want to change out the background. But yeah, if you put it directly on the glass, it's there for good, and you better be happy with the way it looks. So. <laughs> and then you can also use that same foam and like attach rocks together yeah. and stuff like that, and it's already safe to go. Yep. Um, another thing I built in Florida, I had my actual outdoor fish house that was basically, it was like a fish room, but I was able to do outdoors because the weather permitted. Like Jeff has his in a greenhouse, I was able to do mine basically um, with uh, all like poultry netting um, on the sides and put shade cloth on the top. And it stopped any predators from actually being able to get my fish instead of building individual covers on every tank outside. I built one house for them to stay into that predators couldn't affect my fish. And keeping fish in a greenhouse in Florida would almost kill them, it would almost get too hot. Um, the other thing is a Baki shower filter that I made. It was basically uh, the one size down from this 55 gallon, I think it's a 36 uh, gallon tote. Um, I basically created that, put a bulkhead fitting at the base where PVC came out and actually fed one of my small ponds. Then a pump inside the pond came up to this hose and this PVC fitting I made that actually showered down uh, water onto the, basically they're another Coca-Cola product, Coke crates uh, that they deliver Cokes in. They're stackable and I could put layers of media, I used lava rock as the media, and then the water all just showered over it. it also oxygenates the water. Um, the uh, beneficial bacteria that you know feed our cycle is they definitely do better the more oxygen they can get. So when you have something submerged opposed to something that's aerated like in open air with just water trickling over it, they're actually the, the beneficial bacteria thrive better. Yeah. Okay. Another thing I do, a lot of people, I do planted tanks. They want to know how my goldfish don't dig up my plants. Super gluing them onto flat river rocks, smooth kind of river rocks that are fish safe. They won't get all banged up on, like the lava rocks are too rough. I use the smooth river rocks and actually glue my plants to it. Then I kind of sink that down into the sand or you can use them in bare bottoms. Um, and it's a nice decorative way, super glue, as long as it is the gel form is fish safe. You don't want to use any of the liquid, but any of the super glue that's a gel formula is fish safe. Um, so here it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but um, this was basically a large pond I made out of a 500 gallon Intex pool that Jeff uses in his room. It's, um, it's one of the heavier duty ones, not the really um, 
Skippy Intex ones, but it's actually the bigger three ply one. And I, as you can see down here, I use basically pieces of, you can build it like this, or I actually found some really nice matching undamaged pallets, and I cut them down to the height of the pool and placed them all the way around the pool, framed out the top, and then I created these uh, panels, three panels that went on top. Those were like three panels and in a wood frame. And then I used the same uh, poultry netting, the chicken wire, across it, so that kept predators out of my pond. The middle panel had hinges, and I could just open, open it up, do anything I want to with the fish, close it, and I had like a hook latch to keep the animals from lifting it up. Another fun one is a snail trap. We all get those to come in on our plants or other people's fish rooms. You get these pest snails and you don't have puffer fish to eat them. One way to get rid of them is to take basically a little Tupperware container, cut some holes in the side, put some uh, small enough that where the snails can get in but your fish can't. You don't want to make it big enough where your fish can get in. Put a little bit of gravel or rock in the bottom and then some sinking pellets in there. Any type of sinking goldfish food will work. You put the top on it and let it slowly fill with water and leave it in your tank. Leave it there overnight. Tomorrow you will have almost every single snail in your tank in that Tupperware. They can get in and they have a hard time finding their way out that hole because they don't have the food source to smell to get out. So and then you can take it out, dump the snails, do whatever you want to with them. And uh, it's a good way to get rid of pest snails. I did not build this, but I wanted to show you how elaborate you can get with your DIY builds. This is a moving bed filter. Each one of these uh, big 55 gallon drums have moving media in it. And they actually plumbed this where incoming water comes into the top one and slowly works its way down into each one of the moving beds before it goes back out to their pond. Wow. So, I mean, you can do stuff super simple to super complex. And I know this guy, I watched him do about two, three different builds before he got to this, this final This was aquaponics. Product. It was this attached to an aquaponics system? No, this was to a koi pond uh, in wow. the UK. I've seen them attach them to aquaponics. Yeah, but these are really cool moving beds. And again, it's a, just PVC. Uh, you know, you have your bulkhead fittings and then uh, your 55 gallon drums. And it's all just done, all DIY. And it's, I mean, if you start, if you get a large enough pond, you start pricing out koi filters in the 3,000, Ten thousand dollar price range for a filter. You're at two hundred there, probably. Yeah, you're at a couple hundred media. bucks right here. Yeah, but media okay. can be expensive. Yeah. Alrighty, some other household media uh, or different items that I've used for uh, different items in my fish room. Um, scrubbies that we use in the kitchen, as long as they're not have any type of soap product built into the scrubbing, those make really great filter media. You can use them instead of the really expensive bio balls. They actually hold more beneficial bacteria than a bio ball. Um, lava rock for the shower filters, like I said, you can get a, instead of buying this expensive ceramic mediums when you're doing a shower filter, lava rock at Walmart is $4.44 a bag. And I mean, it, my large vacuum filter took two bags of lava rock and actually didn't even use the full two bags. And I was able to fill all those trays with lava rock for $8. Sandblasting sand, I get from Rural King and any type of, I know not Home Depot and Lowe's don't carry it, but different other rural stores actually carry what they call sandblasting sand. And it's a black diamond sand that you can actually use instead of buying expensive aquarium black sand. It's $20 a bag for a 20 pound bag, right? I get these 50 pounds, what is it? Eight for 50 pounds at Tractor Supply. Yeah. So the, at Rural King, they sell it, and I guess Tractor Supply sells it also. Rural King sells it for $6 a bag for 50 pounds. So $6 for 50 pounds or $20 for 20 pounds at the pet store. So if you're trying to save money on sand, that's the way to go. Clamp on lights, uh, I use them all over. Uh, I use them on our brine shrimp hatchery. I've used them on just on the side of tanks that I need to put light in the tank. Um, also, when I do grow outs for my fry, and I try to use my UVB reptile lights to bring out the enhance the color, those are great. You can find the screw-in UVB lights, clamp that on the side of a little tub or a bowl, and you have your UVB lighting for your fish. 
They create light diffusers right here. These are great. They use them, and it was really popular back in the day to do office buildings, and they put these up in the light fixtures as the light diffuser. Those make excellent dividers for aquariums. If you have, you want to separate your males and females, but you only have one space for that variety, you can put all your males on one side, all your females on the other, or you get somebody who's just kind of a, a butthead <laughs> and likes to pick on all the other fish. You don't have the extra space for it somewhere else. You put it over into the other side using these uh, egg crate dividers. If you cut them right, certain times you can actually just wedge it in. But another way to do it is you can actually put suction cups that come on with heaters and attach them with those. Okay, but I find it's best just to wedge. There's actually, there's less that can move through there. Um, colanders, so colanders, you know what you, all the plastic colanders you use to wash your produce or drain your spaghetti into? You have a sick or injured fish. A lot of times if it's superficial wounds, I, I prefer to keep my fish in the same tank. I don't like moving it to a hospital tank unless there's something seriously wrong with that fish. So what I'll do is to isolate the fish to give it some space to heal. I will actually put it in a colander and float it in the tank. It allows it to stay in the same pH, the same water parameters that it's used to being into, and it will actually heal faster by just isolating and separating it without removing it from the tank. Um, and, you know, possibilities are endless. So, I mean, look at household items, and just the only thing you want to make sure is to check to make sure it's fish safe. Yeah. Um, and again, I keep what I call my nurse fishes. If there's something, some new wild idea I have, I test it on them first. I hate to <laughs> They're kind of like my guinea pigs. And uh, they're fish that I probably would have culled anyways. So I keep them around and, and they, you know, I try stuff on them before I put it in with my $600 Blue Egg Phoenix, you know? Yeah. If I have any new DIY items I want to try. Sponges are now really cool. If you look on the back of sponge packets, they'll say aquarium safe or not not for aquarium oh, use. They really, they really say, it say it now. Nice. So yeah, and goldfish. Some things to think. Remember to always be creative. You know, all of the ideas you have, you can bring them to life by just trying. Like I said, maybe take a couple of attempts, but keep trying to get it. Um, Give it a shot and don't be afraid to learn through your failures. Uh, again, I struggled for hours upon hours and days building this the first time. And you know, you learn and then next thing you know, I can make them now and I can't remember how long that was, but it wasn't very long. Make sure it goes uh, into an aquarium that the pop product is fish safe. So anything that's gonna touch the outside that's never gonna have water runoff into the aquarium, you don't really have to check on that. But if it goes inside the aquarium, make sure it's fish safe. And have fun and enjoy the hobby, guys. That's what we're here for. We get stressed out at different things, keeping these fish alive and, and making sure they thrive. We stress out a lot, but we got to remember to have some fun with it. You know, you can't get too wrapped up and too caught up in, you know, the bad stuff that happens. The bad stuff happens, you move on, you have fun still in the hobby and enjoy the hobby. All righty. Any other questions you guys have? Yes. It doesn't. Uh, typically, three slats is what you need to add support. Because if you just do a top one, it can still skew a little bit. That third one anchors it so it doesn't, uh, after it's been drilled or nailed, it doesn't like skew or come off kilter. Any other questions? Earlier you were talking about the air supply. Yes. Uh, what was that website or the brand name? It's called Jimco, is Jimco? the website. Uh, Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming to my discussion. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to death. Oh, and, that's great. Thank you so much. And feel free to come up and take a look at this if you want to see like it, it, the finished build. You can come up and take a look at it. Like I said, normally the screws would be out, but uh, I'll put it like that so you can the elements.